as Sanjeeva said, I'm here to speak about uh, quantum computing to you. And the first question is, why the hell should you care about quantum computing? So, why? Uh, the quantum computers are enormous powerful, and one of the power comes because of the difference between bits and qubits. So a bit is something, we all know that, it has two potential values. It, is, it can be true or it can be false, zero or one. And the quantum bit has an infinite number of potential values. So false is the North Pole, uh, uh, true is the South Pole, and it's a vector, it's a point on this sphere of, uh, of uh, radius one called the Bloch sphere, and in fact it's a combination of zero and one, forget this uh, 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 angles here, it's a, uh, you have values alpha and beta, we will see these are probabilities, so it's a, this is already, it indicates the, the real potential, infinitely many potential values, and only two values. And then you can combine qubits, like you combine bits into a register, you combine qubits into a quantum register, so you have a bunch of, bunch of these qubits here, and if you have n qubits, they can be combinations of zeros, the north poles, or the south pole ones, or any combination between zero and one. If you have n qubits, you have two to the power of n different um, uh, uh, of, of these values, and you have even combinations uh, of, of these values. And now if you think about that uh, you want to emulate or simulate 300 qubits, right? If you remember that the number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the power of 90, if you write this as a, a power of 2, it's 2 to the power of 300, that means you need 300 qubits, and if you want to emulate it or simulate it, you need to turn each and every atom of the universe into a bit, just to simulate it. And 300 qubit is not much. IBM already has 400 qubits commercially available, so you can't do any simulation with, a quant uh, with, with what a quantum computer can do. And if you have this kind of 2 to the power 300 values, a quantum computer, each computation step, manipulates all these values in parallel at the very same time. And this is what we call quantum parallelism, which is one of the enormous, one of the sources of the enormous power of quantum computing. The real power, oh no, next is, here's a, a, a picture of a, of a realization, so a quantum register, as shown here, is a, is a bunch of ions that are trapped into, into a magnetic field, and then you manipulate them. This is one source of implementation, the other is, uh, you do it by superconducting uh, computers. Here is a chip that has only seven qubits, and remember IBM already has 400, different kind of realizations. So this is quantum parallel parallelism. The real power of quantum computers comes from, from a magical thing called entanglement. What you have is, if you have a number of qubits, here I've shown two qubits, you can somehow relate them. If you bring them closely together, they remember each, each other. And the analogy I would, would like to make is based on dices. So the qubits, I substitute the qubits by dices, and now you take the dices far apart. Right? So one dice remains on Earth, the other goes to Mars, and if I now roll my dice that is on Earth, and then I saw which face is up, I know immediately which face is up on Mars. So they are so tightly connected, if you manipulate one, the other is manipulated too. And this is an enormous power, and it's, by the way, it's a contradiction to general relativity. Einstein was also against quantum mechanics, although he got a Nobel Prize for it. Right? This, is, this is really the overall power, right? entanglement. And entanglement is unique in quantum computing. You can't simulate entanglement on a classical computer, and it's known that uh, every quantum algorithm that shows an exponential speed-up compared to classical algorithm, and there is a bunch of them, must exploit entanglement. So entanglement is the real power behind quantum computers. So what will be the impact of quantum computers on us? So first of all, several problems that cannot be solved um, efficiently uh, today based on a classical computer can be solved with uh, efficiently or with a higher precision on a quantum computer. And there are polynomial algorithms for problems which are known to have only exponential classical algorithms. We will come back to a, to a, a couple of examples. And this allows us to solve problems that can't be solved 
practically on a, with a classic computer or only badly in the sense of you can somehow approximate good solutions. And this capability enables new business models, and I give you a, a couple of them. First, at an abstract level, so what kind of efficient quantum algorithms do we have? Uh, one algorithm allows you to compute eigenvalues exponentially faster than on a classical machine. For example, you can use that in feature engineering. We will see examples later on. You can factorize large numbers exponentially faster. This will be terrible, as I explained to you at the, at the, at the end, because you can crack keys of today's crypto infrastructure we have. You can uh, do molecule simulation, for example, in material science to detect uh, new, new batteries. Or you can solve linear um, equation system exponentially faster, for example, in machine learning. I will give you other examples. So what kind of new applications we have at hand? Uh, having my uh, university hat on, we have a bunch of projects with industry partners, and we work in the area of manufacturing to solve optimization problems, for example, in, in uh, scheduling problems, transport and logistics, robot movement can be uh, efficiently uh, uh, com uh, computed here, in product simulations where we solve linear equation systems, where we check uh, uh, stability of uh, bodies of, of cars, of objects, combustion processes in engines and turbines, and in material science, again, this is an eigenvalue problem, right? You, uh, people are using uh, quantum computers to find new catalysts for batteries, to detect new uh, pharmaceuticals, and the uh, people are already speaking about personalized medicine, so that medicine will be, pharmaceuticals will be produced exactly for you, for your body, for your disease that you may have. A very interesting application also is in quantum, uh, in, in machine learning. There is a theorem in machine learning called the no-free-lunch theorem of supervised learning. It basically says the more training data you use, the lower is the average error in learning in a neural net. There's also a similar theorem in quantum uh, uh, computing, the quantum no-free-lunch theorem, but it says very, something very interesting. It says the more the training data is entangled, the less training data, the less training data is needed to learn a quantum neural net. And that means, at the end, that you have a single record of data with a high entanglement degree in order to learn a quantum neural net perfectly. So, my people couldn't believe that, right? But so we, we, we made an experiment. So we got data from an industry partner on Dampas, that basically means this industry partner has a predictor for chassis movement of a car on a bumpy road, and they have this predictor from practical experience, right? There are tons of measurements. We got this data, and we used a quantum neural net to learn this predictor using, admittedly, a simplified car model. Why simplified? I will explain it in a couple of minutes. And what we basically did is, so the diagram is not, we, we verified that the single record of this data with high entanglement degree perfectly uh, trained this neural net, a single record. So it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic improvement that you can do with quantum computers in machine learning. Then optimization. Lots of work these days is done in optimization. Um, uh, for example, quantum computer is good in combinatorial optimization problems, especially uh, quadratic binary optimization problems called cubos. Um, example is gate assignment when airplanes are coming into an, uh, into an airport, which kind of finger do you assign to the airplane, task allocation nurses in hospitals, uh, clustering in machine learning. This is all in the scope of cubo problems. And here are a bunch of applications that we built in the project that we are running, like job scheduling, multi-aircraft routing, customer relationship management, financial portfolios have been reshuffled. Um, then there is a very important problem, traveling salesman problem. You have only exponential um, uh, algorithms to solve it. In a quantum computer, you can solve it uh, polynomially. And there is even a more complex traveling salesman problem called the dynamic traveling salesman problem. And there is another business case that, that, that car companies have. So we, we, work with, we worked with a partner that says, I will uh, connect the, the, the trucks that I have with the quantum computer. When parcels are pumped into the track in the morning, I will automatically compute with the quantum computer the optimal route between the delivery stations. This is already hard classically, but they are going to offer us dynamic 
traveling salesman problem because if the parcel service is now traveling on a road and, and the road has a traffic jam, the new route must be recomputed again because it's no longer valid because one, of, one part of the road is basically, basically blocked. It's even much harder than the traveling salesman problem where quantum computers can basically do it. This is another example of new business models. They want to sell their trucks um, because others don't do it. Um, Not, and again, all, all use cases have small size, right? This is a caveat that I need to, to say. Um, so when should you think about quantum computers? So new business models are there. I hope you are already a little bit interested. New business models sounds good, but when, when, when do you need to care? So today we are in the so-called NISC era. NISC means, comes from, uh, from the following fact. If you have a qubit, a qubit is very sensitive. A qubit may spontaneously decay from one position to its diametral position. Or it may shake a little bit around its current position on this block sphere, on this sphere. Together it's called decoherence. Right? And today's machines are decoherence, so after a couple of milliseconds, the state basically collapses. So you must be fast with your algorithms. Another problem is a lack of fidelity of the operations. So typically, a qubit is the point on the sphere, and manipulation means to rotate the point on the sphere back and forth, and you need to rotate around angle. You specify around which angle you rotate it, but you can't exactly rotate around, for example, an irrational number. This basically means we have a lack of, lack of fidelity, and together, these machines are noisy. Decohere, lack of fidelity, and they are of intermediate state, um, an intermediate scale because often you need thousands of qubits and we only have a couple of hundreds these days in, in, in production. This uh, comes to NISC machines, noisy intermediate scale quantum. It should remind NISC and KISC machines, right? Uh, just, just, uh, this is now called NISC. The consequence of NISC is as follows. So noise, me noise may pile up when you compute your, your, your algorithm. That means the algorithm must be small, whatever small means. Small means basically uh, you have horizontal lines. The horizontal lines on the right side are the qubits that you manipulate, and the rectangles are the, are the operations on the, on the different qubits. Operations may be performed in parallel. These are the slices, the layers. And the number of qubits times the number of layers must be smaller than the error rate of the quantum computer. The consequence is, um, ideally, you use many qubits, because if you have many qubits, I said that before, you can't simulate them, right? Because if you have 100 qubits, you need thousands of GPUs, 10,000 of GPUs in order to simulate it. So typically, more than 47, 48 can't be simulated, because then you need to turn all computers into a simulation machine for a quantum computer. So the more qubits you have, the more likely it is that you detect quantum advantage in your machine. The downside is that the algorithm must be small in the sense that you have only a very few parallel layers to manipulate the qubits in, in parallel. We say that, that today's implementation must have low depth. The implication is that it is as follows. You have classical data that you want to analyze on a quantum computer and you need to transform the classical data into a quantum state. How do you do that? The first part of the algorithm must take this classical data and generate this quantum state in the quantum computer. So they consume already a couple of parallel layers in order to pump data in the quantum computer. And if you want to pump tons of data in the quantum computer, there is no time left for the proper algorithm. This is why today's problems are only, uh, 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 can only be solved with, with uh, I, I, I don't call it toy, amounts of data with small amounts of data. So you can today, as of today, it is only feasibility study that you can do based on the current machines. So how are these qubits manipulated? Remember, a qubit is a combination of zero and one, and you have these coefficients alpha and beta. This alpha and beta are not only real numbers, they are complex numbers, right? So, but again, Uh, the, the alpha determines the probability that at the end you measure a zero and the beta is the probability that you measure a one. So if you measure the result of the manipulation of a qubit, you will get either a one or a zero. That means alpha square and beta square modulus must sum up to one. 
That means a qubit is, as I said before, a vector of length one. It's a point on this, on this Bloch sphere. Manipulation means you turn a vector of length one into another vector of length one. So you rotate it a little bit on the Bloch sphere, right? This kind of rotation operations are so-called unitary maps. This is a term from, from complex linear algebra. So that basically means a quantum algorithm is nothing but a series of this kind of damned unitary matrices. Ah, that means, basically, um, the learning curve for quantum programming is quite, quite high. Because programming a quantum computer means that you need to understand complex vector spaces and linear algebra. It's a series of these kind of unitary matrices. And here's a picture of a simple quantum algorithm. Right? There is no if then else, there is no loop, nothing. It's a series of, of matrices that you arrange on this on this qubits, which is by the way called a quantum circuit. So and this is the, described in a language called CASM, quantum assembler. So today we are in the age of assembler. There is no high-level language for quantum computing these days. You are at the assembler level. So skill development takes time because it's very different to program a quantum computer than program a classical computer. But quantum technology is developing these days extremely fast, much faster than expected in the, in the, in the, in the, in the past. That means if you don't start now thinking about quantum computing, um, you, uh, you run the risk to be left uh, behind because a, a bunch of your competitors will definitely work with quantum computers, or they may already have set up teams to work with quantum computers. So how do you build this kind of quantum applications? This is a roadmap of, of IBM. It shows that they are in track. So uh, 2023, they delivered on the roadmap that they, that they set up before. But this is not the main point. The main point is here that even they squeeze the timeline from right to the left. So typically, they are developing faster than they announced. This is not only f f the case for IBM, but also for Regetti, INQ, and all the other vendors that are in place. But the real important thing for this conference is a, a statement that IBM made uh, about un one, uh, 18 months ago. We need middleware for quantum. How we get quantum, I read it, how we get quantum and classical working together. It will be essential to have seamless integrated workflows that can take the best of classical and so on. So you need middleware. So the setup, first of all, is the solutions that use quantum, al quantum alg algorithms to produce software always need to combine classical, always need to combine classical software and quantum software. We call these kind of solutions hybrid. So you need to use integration technology like workflows or variants of Ballerina in order to build an application that is exploiting quantum. And in order to do that, you need an, you need a, you need a team that brings together classical programmers, integration specialists, as well as quantum algorithm specialists in order to build these kinds of new applications. And you need to build a corresponding team. And they need to try to speak the same language. This is what we find out over the last couple of days, uh, <laughs> years, when we built this kind of, kind of apps. It's damn difficult. Right? to build teams that speak different languages so that they jointly work on, a, on one and the same problem. And in order to assess if you are convinced that you should invest in quantum, right, you should assess the benefit, the utility of quantum computing for your enterprise based on business-related problems. Don't invent some toy problems. Business-related problems, take a problem that you can't solve today. And, solve, uh, today. and this team needs to analyze existing quantum algorithms um, so that they indicate whether there is an advantage over classical algorithms. Um, and then you need to implement the, the application, see whether it works with small amount of, amount of data, and then you take a look at the roadmap of the quantum computing vendors, how fast they scale their machines up to the size that you need, the number of qubits you need, and the length of the algorithms. Developing that, so we started naively with industry partners, but soon the industry partners were asked, how do we develop these kind of complicated applications? So we were faced with the problems to recommend uh, development life cycle. So the classical software life cycle on the left lower side is to take some software life cycle that you like. 
So then what we did in, in the university setting is we developed where we proposed a life cycle for building quantum circuits. We extended the existing workflow life cycles to include quantum. We thought about how to run, how to deploy and undeploy, how to manage, observe these quantum applications. Quantum applications run sometimes for days. So it's this long running task that you have. So you want to monitor them. So we have an operation life cycle. And all this life cycle externalized tasks to the outside. I only uh, showed a couple of steps here. So there is some work going on in the community. That, that teaches you how to build this kind of uh, applications. In quantum machine learning, I give you just a real world example. Quantum machine learning, you need to do data preparation. Data preparation is already a workflow. So you read data from a database. Typically, this data is textual data. And by the way, the steps with the hammer are classical code, right? You read data from a database, textual data, but most machine learning algorithms work with numerical data. That means we need to transform the textual data into numerical data and data preparation. Then you do feature engineering, again, a bunch of classical steps are there, and then in the middle you see a single step that has an atom there. This is a quantum computing step, right? We are, we are, we are computing eigenvalues there. We are a variational quantum eigensolver. One, then we perform PCA, and then clustering must be done. Again, a bunch of classical steps, and finally we go again to the quantum computer and, and build the cluster, uh, because we wanted to compute clusters here. And some of the classical steps are implemented as, as APIs, and we, of course, use uh, cell-based architecture to build them. You have microservices. We heard, we heard uh, talks uh, yesterday how, uh, how we can do that. Right? So you have a bunch of microservices that communicate. You wrap them into cells, uh, externalize the feature, the functions via API. So this is also vice, a nice match of, of what we heard in the conference, what you can do with Quantum. And then the people we worked with wanted to, wanted to reuse the application. So they were looking for a packaging format, right? So the upper layer are the applications and how they communicate. And then you need to define what are the, are the dependencies. So this kind of structure is called a, a topology. And all the artifacts of the topology can be wrapped into a zip file, which we call very nicely a quantum application archive. And we built with industry partners uh, something, some sort of, of a web store, like an app store, where the quantum applications are available online. Some are for payment there, some are for free. Uh, the classical code uh, was, wrap, was wrapped as an API, and we used the WSO2's API manager to hide this behind, behind a paywall, for example, and we used the capabilities to, uh, to define their non-functional properties. And again, skill development takes time. So what is also available is the ability to, re to reuse experience that others have in quantum computing and use proven solutions. So we built a pattern language for quantum computing that you can use to start building your application to jumpstart this. You don't run into the same errors that developers run into before. So there is a, there's a, there's a quantum uh, pattern language in place. We also built with industry partners a platform um, uh, that allows you to build these ap this applications. We also had uh, a year ago, or 18 months ago, a variant with, uh, with Corio here, so that you could build quantum applications based on, based on Corio. Um, but there is a threat that I mentioned before, a severe threat, a really severe threat. And the threat is, basically, quantum algorithms exist that can solve something that is called in computer science the discrete logarithm problem. Damn, that sounds complicated, but what it means is you can factorize numbers very fast, uh, which is the, under, uh, which is the underlying problem behind RSA, for example, or you can, you can, you can uh, crack elliptic curve cryptography like elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. This basically means the underpinnings of our today's security infrastructure is absolutely threaded, right? And the rescue, and, uh, m many people take it absolutely serious. The US has, uh, a, a couple of years ago, kicked off a project in NIST that is collecting algorithms that can't be cracked today classically and neither by a quantum algorithm. And all these algorithms, most of these algorithms are lattice-based cryptography. 
extremely complicated mathematics, vector spaces that consist out of vectors, the components are polynomials, you don't want to understand all the mathematics. Right? But again, the important point is they can't be cracked today. The algorithms we are collecting, uh, they can't be cracked today, but they, can be, they could be cracked in future. This is why such an infrastructure must be agile. The infrastructure must be able to, be, to plug in algorithms that are not yet cracked and plug out algorithms that are cracked. And this is a damn complicated problem, and the question is, are you safe? So if you are threatened, you must start a migration process to rebuild the infrastructure that you have uh, to become quantum safe, because if you have confidential information that uh, you need to keep confident for a couple of years. This is the T-shelf time, right? But um, T-collapse time is the time industry rolls out a quantum computer that can crack keys. And if the migration time and the shelf time is longer than the collapse time, you are in severe trouble. Yeah, because all your information could be cracked. And by the way, there's something going on called steal now, harvest later. So people are really stealing data that are securely um, encrypted because they want to, want to get money from you in a couple of years when a powerful quantum computer is there. By the way, this is called the Mosca, uh, uh, Mosca's inequality. And just an example, if you think that the collapse time is 10 years, that we need 10 years to build a powerful quantum computer, and you have data that must be kept confident for uh, secure for 10, for 10 years, you must, the migration time you have is zero years. That means you must already have this, this uh, infrastructure available. It means you must begin now. And by the way, there are serious papers that came out a couple of months ago with IBM and Rigetti and, and researchers. The, the best guess is, even IBM guesses this, that end of this decade, they have a powerful quantum computer that can crack all, in, all keys that we have already now. This is a severe, absolutely severe threat. No online banking, no online uh, uh, shopping a anymore because the infrastructure will collapse. But WSO2 is acting already. As Sanjeeva already indicated in his keynote yesterday, so work is underway. What we have is the communication between Ballerina services is quantum safe. The crypto API that is in Ballerina supports post-quantum cryptography so that you use quantum safe uh, algorithms to decrypt your information, encrypt it. Identity server on-prem and Asgardio uh, as, as, uh, in, in, in the cloud is about to, to become, it is already quantum safe. Inbound, outbound communication is quantum safe. The data stored in this product is quantum safe. Uh, the, the transition tokens are quantum safe. So this is basically what, what WSO2 is already doing in this space. Uh, first to note is quantum computers are specialized devices, right? Don't expect a quantum mobile phone anytime soon, right? And the industry is not really saying classical computers are basically dead, right? But you always need classical computers plus quantum computers. And the impact on everyday life over the next couple of days will be subtle. That means in the sense you don't note immediately that the quantum computer is doing something, but there will be the development of personalized drugs, uh, long-lasting batteries based on quantum computer, highly precise navigation, and so on. But again, there's a cryptography threat that I said before. The main takeaways are quantum computers are real with a very, very different programming model. New applications are at the horizon new that allow new uh, business models. Quantum applications are always hybrid, the mixture of classical and quantum programs. Building quantum application is an integration problem. Existing software lifecycle needed to be or need to be extended and modified. That's what's going on in the software engineering community. Quantum applications, of course, can be deployed on premise in the cloud, any mixture. And there is a security threat, so I hammer that in, in, into your head. And WSO2 is already active. Conclusion, why should they take care about uh, quantum computing? Because you can make new business when you need to begin now, otherwise you are lost. And how? That's what I said before, skill development, blah, 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 blah. And now, bringing together the, Sanjeeva said that the large structure, the universe with this damn quantum, quantum stuff, why, why is that the case? Well, we learned yesterday 
um, uh, from Lisa that there is dark matter, and dark matter is the platform that shapes our current, uh, the, 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 the visible matter. The whole universe is shaped by dark matter. But dark matter and the visible matter is in, in, in space. So in space, for at least three decades, is a constant in science. Space is given. Nobody thinks about what the hell is space, where does it come from? Since a very few years, something very thrilling goes on, namely, the physicists themselves begin to understand that space is not fundamental, but space is a fabric that consists of, you won't believe it, entangled qubits. So space is not something homogeneous that is there, we don't think about it, but space is constantly created. It's quantum information that is entangled, interwoven to build the fabric that is space. Right? And this is the platform, the platform for dark matter, for visible matter, that, for, yeah, that is the platform of the universe. So the universe uses this quantum information that is entangled as a platform which is very smart. Right? And what WSO2 is doing, they motivate you to go platformless now. So we should learn from the, from the, from the universe that, that the platform is invisible, platformless, but we need it. So and this is uh, what is called it from qubit. Everything is from qubit. This is the, 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 multi, the, 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 the statement that the physicists have it from qubit. Everything comes from qubits, even the platform of the whole universe. So, thanks. Oh, a, a final quote from Enrico uh, Fermi, Nobel Prize laureate. He basically said, I'm still confused, <laughs> but at a higher level. Yeah? <laughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs>